Okay. Welcome everyone. Let's get started with some course announcements. Uh, first of all, a clarification on problem three. Um, in proving that it is possible to determine the remainder, that should just be the same as proving that there is exactly one possible value for this remainder. Uh, you don't have to really describe an algorithm. You may end up doing that. Um, but the reason why they're basically the same is if there are a finite number of possibilities, you could just try them all. Uh, there will be office hours right after class today. Um, I encourage everyone to stick around and um, ask questions if you are puzzled about things on the problem set. Are there any questions? Everyone should have grades for problems at one and there are solutions posted on the Slack. Okay, let's get going. So this is continuing on from last time where we were discussing derivatives and in particular double derivatives. So if you recall from last time, the second derivative of a function is going to measure the curvature. So if it has negative curvature, right, the, the second derivative is, is negative, then it's going to sort of bend down. The slope of the function is decreasing. Here it starts out positive, it gets lower, and then it becomes, the slope becomes negative. Here there's no curvature, so the, the function is just a line. Um, that's the slope is constant. And if you think about the double derivative, the double derivative of a function is going to be zero exactly when the function, when, when the single derivative of the, of the function is a constant. So when the function itself is a linear function. So the only functions that have double derivative zero everywhere are just linear functions. And then positive curvature where the second derivative is, is positive, the slope is going up. And so you have this sort of curving up thing. Again, we say if the function is convex, if, it, if the second derivative is greater than or equal to zero for all x, function is concave, if it's less than or if the second derivative is less than or equal to zero for all x, and most functions are neither convex nor concave. There are places where they curve up and there are places when they curve down. There are also functions, namely lines, which are both convex and concave because their second derivative is equal to zero everywhere. So do not say convex or concave say convex or concave, or probably neither convex nor concave. So why is convexity a useful thing? There are actually a lot of reasons why convexity is useful, and we can just talk about one of them, but in a lot of situations that you might encounter a convex function, the reason why it's important that it's convex is because of this thing, which is Jensen's inequality, mm. that is pronounced with a ya, um, Jensen's inequality. Um, so the, Jens, uh, the, 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 the formulation of Jensen's inequality um, it's in its basic form, there's a weighted version as well, um, says that if you have a convex function, so that, remember that's the second derivative is positive, so it curves up. If you have a convex function in any number of, of um, it, 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 in, in general, there will be like versions for, for higher numbers of variables, but let's, let's look at, let's look at the, just the single variable version. Um, function of x1 plus function of x2 all the way up to function of xn, if you take a look at the average of those, it's going to be greater than or equal to the function applied to the average of those, those points. So if you take a number of points, you average the function evaluated at all of those points, you're going to get something that's bigger than or equal to the function evaluated at the average of those points. Here's a way to think of it in terms of expected value. I realize we haven't covered expected value yet. Um, so don't worry if you're not getting this. Um, this is just if, if for, for those who have, who have seen this notation before. Uh, we will cover it, that later. Um, but a way to think about it is here's this function. If you're taking, two, here, the, the version for two points is pretty simple. You mentioned these two points. The average of those two points is here. Because the function is curving up, if you take the function at the average, you're going to be lower than the average of the function, which is like here. So this is higher than this. Expected value of the function at the average is 
larger than or equal to the function evaluated at the average. This is sort of an intuition for two points. I'm not really going to prove it, but this is basically a proof. So this, this proof is beautiful geometric proof. Um, imagine you have a bunch of points in, on, on this curve, uh, f of x. Each of these points is, I, I, I pulled this from somewhere, so it, the notation is slightly different. But imagine this is like x, f of x, x2, f of x2. So if you take each of these points, they're going to form some kind of polygon. Here it's a, here it's a triangle. And then you can imagine taking the average of these points. And that's going to give you the center of mass. It's going to give you just the average of the x coordinates of the points. And it's going to give you the average of the, the y coordinates of the points. OK? Mm. And what this is saying is that if you have a convex function, then the center of mass is going to have to be above the um, it is going to have to be above the curve, if that makes sense. Because if you evaluate if the center of mass is going to be the average of the x's and the average of the f's evaluated at the x's is the y coordinate. And so you're saying that the y coordinate is above the y coordinate for the average of the x's. If you didn't get this, don't really worry. This is just sort of an intuitive picture for why this is the case. Center of mass of any points on this convex curve has to be above the, um, above the curve itself. Are there any questions about this? Actually proving it a bit more rigorously is a little bit tricky, only a little bit. Could we also say that any point in the polygon is above the curve? Yeah, exactly, because it's convex. Any point in this polygon is going to be above the curve. I mean, this is basically a proof. So. Yeah, it's it, this is basically a proof. So I don't think it's uh, yeah. It, it, there are there are other ways to prove it that are sort of more formal and you know, using using fancy math. But mm. when does equality arise? This is a really good question. Whenever you have a, an inequality, you should ask when equality arises. Equality arises if and only if um, f is linear on the interval in question. Um, so if, um, if, 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 if uh, the second derivative is exactly equal to zero, and we'll see why that's the case in a moment. Okay. So suppose F is concave, then a, just taking the negative of f gives you something that is, I'm sorry, this should be the negative f of x is convex. Um, if f of x is concave, the negative f of x is convex because negative f of x has a positive second derivative if f of x has a negative second derivative. So if negative f of x is convex, then we can apply Jensen's inequality to negative f of x. And so this is what's true if f is concave. Basically, it's just the same thing as this, except that the inequality goes the other way if f is concave. This is another reason, another way you can see that not all functions are either convex or concave. For convex functions, this thing is always greater than or equal to this thing. For concave functions, this thing is always less than or equal to this thing. Um, so, what happens if 
the second derivative is just zero. So it's both convex and concave. Just if, if, if f prime of, double prime of x is equal to, to, to zero everywhere. Yeah, so it becomes a quality here. It, it was greater than or equal to if it's convex. It was less than or equal to if it's concave. That means that we have a linear function and these things are just equal, which makes sense. And you can, you can easily show that this is true if f of x equals ax plus b, something linear function. Are there any questions about this? But yeah, basically, this is a really core property of convex functions that will be really useful in a lot of different contexts, especially in probability. Like if you've seen the expectation lower bound or elbow, Jensen's inequality. OK. Let's prove the AMG inequality that we saw before. This is again the AMG inequality, the arithmetic mean, though the, just the average of some numbers, if they're non negative, is greater than or equal to the geometric mean, so the nth root of their product. How can we do this? What are some thoughts? Some of this looks a bit like Janssen's inequality. Yeah, so people are suggesting logs. When you see things added together, and also the same things multiplied together, this is a great situation to think about logarithms because log of x, y equals log of x plus log of y. So let's look at the function log of x. Is log of x concave or convex or not? You can imagine visualizing it, or you can just literally work it out. So there is a huge consensus that log of x is convex. You are all wrong. <laughs> convex does not mean it's curving upward. It means it's curving. It's not, it doesn't mean it's curving like this. It means it's curving like this. The function log of x looks like this. It is concave because, well, how can we prove it? What's the second derivative? Second derivative is the derivative of, if we, if we take the derivative once, it's one over x. If we take the derivative again, it is the derivative of one over x, which is negative one over x squared. And then that's always going to be negative. And remember, something's concave if the second derivative is negative. I realize this is like one of the reasons why, why this is confusing is that in common parlance, like a curve sort of looking like this means it's convex, like in just in common parlance. But in math, if it's curving like this, that means it's concave. If it's curving like this, it means it's convex. I realize this is super confusing. But yeah. Um, so this is always less than zero. So it's concave. 
let's see what we can do with this. So we can apply Jensen's inequality to the negative of log, which is going to be convex. So let's apply it to negative log x. This is again what we want to prove. But let's see what we have if we use Jensen's inequality on negative log x. If we apply it to negative log x for some numbers, we have the average of negative log x is greater than or equal to um, negative log of the average. Okay. And now let's just, again, let's get rid of all the negative signs. So we move this over here, and then we move this over here. So it's just the same as flipping the inequality. So log of the average is greater than or equal to the average of the logs. Great. This is super useful. This is really, really useful. Um, you will find this, this particular form of Jensen's inequality is probably the single most important form of Jensen's inequality that you will see. It's the logs. Um, and again, this will turn up all the time if you're working with probabilities. Uh, for example, like there are so many situations where you're working with log probabilities. Okay. So what can we do with this? Well, because of that thing where the sum of logs is a log of the product, we can just rewrite this as log of the product over n. And then we can write that as log of the nth root of the product. So what do we have now? I also really like the, the idea of, yeah, if it looks like the roof of a cave, then it's concave. And if it looks like the, the V in convex, oh, I guess there's a V in concave too, never mind. Um, yeah, if you take an exponential of this, then you get AMGM. You don't have to use anything about exponential being a convex function, you're just taking the, the exponential of both sides. If this is greater than this, then the exponential of this is greater than the exponential of this. Okay. Awesome. So there's one very subtle point here. Um, what did we actually need to show? Um, we needed to show that this is true for these greater than or equal to zero. But we can apply it only if log x is defined and log of 0 isn't defined. So we can only prove it using this for all of these great, strictly greater than 0. Why is that not a problem? Because the actual form of, form of AMGM is greater than or equal to 0. Why, is it, why, why are these two equivalent? Why did we not need to worry about that? Yeah, if any of them is equal to zero, it's really obvious because the right-hand side is just zero. So the only situation in which this is in any way not obvious is if they're all positive, strictly positive. Okay. Oh, by the way, I, I, I don't know if I, I mentioned this at any point in the, in the course, if any of you who are francophone are having issues with this notion of positive and negative. The words positive and negative do not mean the same as positive and negative. Um, so positive means non-negative. It means, as I understand it, greater than or equal to zero. Whereas positive in English means strictly greater than zero. This is a huge confusion in math between like French and English speaking mathematicians. Um, so I, you, you even sometimes hear in a talk, somebody say French positive to mean non-negative. Yeah, so zero is not positive in English. Okay. Maxima and minima. This is one reason why derivatives are useful um, 
I realize many of you have seen this before. Critical points of a differentiable function um, are points where the derivative is zero. If a point is a local maximum or a local minimum of f of x, then it is a critical point. Then the derivative is zero at that point. So like, if you just look at this pictorially, it's going to make sense. If you have this function and you look at the local maxima here, this is one local maximum, this is another one, this is a local minimum, you see that the slope is just zero because if it were tilted, then you would be able to go up in one direction. If it were tilted the other way, you'd be able to go up in the other direction. So if it's a local maximum or local minimum, it has to be the derivative is zero. Um, again, yeah, algebraically, this also makes sense. If the slope were positive, then increasing x would make f of x even higher. If the slope were negative, then, um, then making x smaller would increase f of x. Um, so um, how do you determine if something is a local maximum or a local minimum? In answer to the question, I was just defining critical points of a function that is differentiable. So if it has, if it's discon if it's discontinuous, then it's non-differentiable. Um, how do you determine if something is a local maximum or a local minimum? If you find out that it that its derivative is zero. Yeah, you can look at the second derivative. Second derivative, uh, if the second derivative is greater than zero, then you have a local maximum. Just sort of intuitively, it's in that small area, it is convex, which means that it has to be a local minimum. Sorry, I, I'm so sorry, I messed this up. If, um, I will correct this in the slides, but if the second derivative is less than zero, then it is a local maximum. If the second derivative is greater than zero, then it is a local minimum. I apologize for that. If this is concave, then it is a local maximum. If it's locally concave, if it's locally convex, then it is a local minimum. These two signs should be swapped. I'm very sorry about that. Again, I will correct it in the slides. If the second derivative is equal to zero, then it is neither a local maximum nor, it is, nor a local minimum. It is a saddle point. And you can see, again, why that, or it, it may be a local maximum or, or, or a local minimum. Um, but it doesn't tell, this, this test does not tell you, at least. I'm not going to go into more details on this. This is stuff that's often covered in calculus. I just wanted to pr provide a little bit of connection to this from what we've been discussing. Happy to answer more questions later. Something else, I'm not really going to be discussing integrals, but I wanted to quickly bring it up how it connects to derivatives. So the integral of a function um, is one thing you can think about with an integral is the area under a curve. That's only one of many ways to interpret an integral. It's sort of a sucky way to interpret an integral too, because if a curve is like above or below the x-axis, you have to make all this sort of casework. But if the curve is above the x-axis, then the area under the curve between a and b is the integral from a to b of f of x dx. As a, that is a, a, a simple definition of the integral. Um, the fundamental theorem of calculus, we've seen a couple of fundamental theorems. We've seen the fundamental theorem of algebra, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Uh, fundamental theorem of calculus states that the derivative and the integral, they, they are sort of inverses of each other. So if you take the derivative, of the integral of f of t from a to x, then you get f of x. Notice that the x is in the limit here. Let's, let's see why this is the case. If you are, just think of this whole integral thing as the area under the curve from a, some fixed a starting point to x. How, what, is the, what is the derivative of a of x? It's the, it's the rate of change of a of x. So if you imagine like moving x a little bit, so from x to x plus h, 
how much is the area going to change? What is the difference between A of X plus H and A of X? Well, the excess is going to be just this box. And there's going to be relatively little that isn't contained in this rectangle if, this is, if H is really small. So the difference is basically the height of the box, which is F of X, times the width of the box, which is H. So A of X plus H is basically A of X plus H times F of X. So if you look at this derivative, it's the limit as H goes to zero of H F of X over H equals F of X, which is just what we wanted to prove here. The derivative of the area from A to X is F of X. Are there questions about this? This is just the intuition behind why integrals and derivatives are inverses. There is a lot more going on here. And I'm not really going to go into it. This doesn't depend upon A. The exact value of the integral will depend upon A, but the derivative of this doesn't depend upon A. If you change A, you change what A of X is, but you change it by a constant. If you move A from 0 to 1, you'll have changed it by the area between 0 and 1, but you're not going to change the rate of change of A of X. You're just going to change the, the actual value of A of X. So here's another form of the fundamental theorem of calculus. If you put the derivative inside the integral, so you were taking the integral of something that is the derivative, then you're going to get the function evaluated at the upper endpoint minus the function evaluated at the lower endpoint. And this is in practice how you compute integrals. You find a function g such that the thing inside the integral is g prime, and then you just take this difference. And it's proved very similarly. It's just, again, with these boxes and areas. And it's, yeah, it is basically the same picture. So for example, if you wanted to compute the area under a curve, f of x, we'd find a function g of x such that g prime of x equals f of x. As here, here is an example. If you're finding the area under the parabola t squared, looks like this, from negative 1 to, to 1, then you're just going to compute this integral. That's what, that's what the area under the parabola is. And we can find a function whose derivative is t squared. So we know that t cubed is going to be 3, is going to have derivative 3t squared. So 1 third t cubed is going to have derivative just t squared. So in that case, we can just plug it in up here. g of x is 1 third t, g of t is 1 third t squared, t, t cubed. So we have 1 third t cubed minus, uh, evaluated at 1, minus 1 third t cubed evaluated at minus 1. And so that's two thirds. Are there any questions? Yeah, I'm going over this a bit fast because I figured that many of you have seen this and we're not really delving in more deeply than a standard calculus course would. Okay. Partial derivatives. Now we're done with single variable calculus. I guess not exactly, but. Um, what is this proof technique called is a question. Um, I don't know that there is really a, a, a proof technique involved here. It's just like calculus. Yeah. Um, at this point, a lot of what we're learning is not specifically proof techniques. It's more sort of just applying different kinds of math. And so here we're just doing calculus. Yeah. So we've basically studied what we're going to study from single variable calculus. There's going to be some stuff with Taylor series next class. But uh, partial derivatives. We're going on to multivariable calculus. So we can also compute the partial derivative of a function in many variables with respect to one of those variables. And just basically treating the other variables as if they're constants. And there is a, there's a reason for this. But if there are many variables involved, then we write this thing partial. And in LaTeX, this is backslash partial. 
Um, it's kind of annoying to write backslash partial a lot of times. There is a way in LaTeX, if you're writing a thing many, many times, I know there have been many situations where I've had to write backslash partial a lot. And so I write this, I, I write a, a, a function that just says new command backslash like dd is equal to backslash partial. And then I don't have to write as many things. Um, I thought that Dell was something, I thought that Dell was something different. Um, but there's a, a question about that. Okay, so yeah, you write this this term with a with a sort of curvy um, a curvy d partial. It's not the same as a delta. It's not. It's, it is not a. a, a it is not a, a delta. Um, okay, for example, um, the partial derivative of this with respect to x is 2x plus y because the partial derivative of this with respect to x is 2x, just, yeah. Treating y as a constant, this is just the derivative of a constant, so that's zero. Treating y as a constant, the derivative of x times y is just y because any constant times x, if you take the derivative, is just that constant. Likewise, if you take the derivative of this with respect to y, you get this is just a constant, so it has derivative zero. 2y squared has derivative 4y if you're taking the derivative with respect to y. And xy, again, that's a constant times y, so the, the, the derivative is just the constant, which is x. Okay, so these are the partial derivatives of this thing with respect to x and y. Let's look at the gradient. The gradient of a multivariable function is the vector of partial derivatives with respect to the variables. So if you just take the derivative with respect to each of the variables, the partial derivative with respect to each of the variables, you put them into a vector. This is your gradient. So as an example, if you had this function of three variables, the gradient would be 2x, 2y, 4z, because the gradient with respect, the derivative with respect to x is 2x, with respect to y is 2y, with respect to z is 4z. So the reason why the gradient is interesting is because it's basically, it's, it's as close as we get to a single thing capturing the derivative with respect to all the variables. So in one variable, how do we use the derivative to, to estimate the amount that, some, that a function changes? Well, it's the slope, it's the instantaneous slope. So function of x plus epsilon is roughly function of x plus epsilon times derivative at x. This is a first order approximation. We'll, we'll see what a second order approximation is when we look at Taylor series. But this is just basically saying, it's, it's just the equation of a line. So if you have a slope, if you have this curve, sorry, I should have drawn out a picture here. If you have a curve and you look at a point on the curve, you're looking at a point really close by on the curve and you're saying, Roughly, where is that point? Well, it's basically if I took a, if I approximated the curve by a line, I went along the curve in that direction, like I went along the line in that direction, and I saw what the slope of the line was. So, like how much I was going up or down based on the slope of the line. Okay. Now, in two variables, what happens here? How do we work out what happens if we perturb both x and y simultaneously? Yeah, so there are many ways of thinking about this. If you imagine that you have this, so it's, it's two variables. So you can imagine a graph. You have a surface here. And at any particular point, you approximate this curvy, curvy surface with a plane that is tangent to that surface. We can see what the surface looks like at the moment. But here's, that's, that's a geometric way to think about it. Here's an algebraic way to think about it. We have 
for each individual variable, we can just use the thing with the derivative right up here. This is just a single variable. If we perturb one at a time, f of x plus epsilon x y is approximately f of x y plus epsilon x partial respect to x f of x y. That's just if we like the reason this is true is because of this earlier equation. If we're treating y as a constant, right? Okay, so that's if we perturb one of them. What if we perturb two of them? Well, if we perturb two of them, I sorry, I realize there's a lot of notation here, but it's, it's not difficult. So if we perturb two of them, let's perturb one and then the other one. If we've already perturbed, if we've already added epsilon to x, we can add epsilon to y too, and then just do the same thing. So this is equal to if we started out at x plus epsilon x, y, and then we added epsilon y to y. This is, again, the same equation as up here, just if we started out at x plus epsilon x and moved y. Yes, yeah, sorry, that should be, I'm sorry, this should be partial with respect to y. Good call. I have a lot of typos here. Partial with respect to y. This should also be partial with respect to y, and this should also be partial with respect to y. Very sorry about that. So, yes, exactly. This is epsilon y times partial with respect to y of this. And now, let's look at what this is. Well, this, we already saw how we could get it. We, it's a perturbation of f of x, y. So f of x, y plus this thing up here. So now we have two corrections. We have the correction to get from f of x, y to f of x plus epsilon y. And then we have the correction to get from f of x plus epsilon y to f of x plus epsilon y plus epsilon, recognizing that the epsilons are slightly different. So let's re then we have this. We have these two correction terms. Somewhat awkwardly, this is the derivative. Again, this should be derivative with respect to y. The derivative of f of x plus epsilon y. We'd like it to be f of x y. But basically, we're going to assume that this is approximately f of x y. The derivative is not going to change so fast. So we can approximate this derivative by this derivative if these epsilons are really small. OK, so now what we have is we have f of x, y plus epsilon x partial of f with respect to x plus epsilon y partial of f with respect to this again should be y. And so that's just f of x, y plus gradient of f dot at epsilon x epsilon y this is why a simpler way to a simpler way to, to to write it remember the gradient is just this partial comma this partial it's a it's a two element vector and if we dot it take the dot product of that with the epsilons then we get this dot product so that's why the gradient is useful because it basically writes allows us to write this correction in a really in a really short form struggling to visualize it here is a here is a a, a picture Suppose we're trying to approximate a single point uh, where we have, a, we have a, a single point on this grid. I couldn't find a really good visualization. This is the best I could find. Try, try to um, visualize one of these grid points and then imagine moving along x, so along, along one of the grid lines, and then along y, so the other direction of grid line. So you're going to the opposite point on one of these squares. What you can imagine doing is you can imagine doing two linear fits. You, you, you move along one line in the x direction, and then you move along a perpendicular line in the y direction. And how much did you go up overall? Well, you went up the gradient with respect to x, and then the gradient with respect to y. This is an exactly steepest descent. So let's, or yes, but I'll get to that in a moment. So in general, what we have is that the way to approximate f of x1 plus epsilon 1, xn plus epsilon n, is by taking f of all the x's plus the gradient dotted with all of these epsilons. 
question. Did I do gradient respect to X only in the last slide? Uh, again, there was a typo. This should be Y, this should be Y, this should be Y. I'm sorry for the typo. So again, this was this first step was just moving it along the x direct, uh, moving it um, along the y direction from the point x plus epsilon x, and the second step was saying, okay, how do we get to x plus epsilon y? Well, we went from x y. So here you can imagine sort of going backwards. This is moving from x y to x plus epsilon y, and then moving from x plus epsilon y to x plus epsilon y plus epsilon. So that's why you're doing a step in the x direction and then a step in the y direction. And when you go in the x direction, you move by epsilon with respect to x, partial derivative with respect to x. When you go in the y direction, you move by epsilon y, partial derivative with respect to y. And in higher dimensions, it's just the same thing. So this is, as people have noted, why gradient descent and ascent works. Why is that? Well, if what 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 is the what what is gradient descent or ascent? Suppose you have a, you suppose you you want to move from a certain point in a certain direction. You need to choose the direction that maximizes your increase. What the increase is is just the difference between f of x plus epsilon and f of x. So how would you maximize this difference? Suppose that your epsilons have a fixed length. What is a quick way to see which direction will maximize the difference? Remember, this equation up here. Why is it true? Yeah, so it's the, it's, it's the gradient. But why is it the gradient? Well, because you suppose you, what you're looking at is the difference between these two is the gradient dotted with the epsilons. Now, imagine that this is your gradient. It points in some direction. This is your epsilons. You move your epsilon around. You can decide which direction it should point in. For any direction you point in, what you get is your increase is the dot product of this fixed vector and this movable vector. When is the dot product maximized? Well, remember the dot product is going to be, uh, it's going to be the norm of this vector times the norm of this vector times the cosine of the angle between the two. So if you make the cosine bigger by making them perpendicular, you get the dot product zero. If you make the cosine one, then you make the dot product as big as possible, and the cosine is one when the angle is zero. So you, you maximize this when they're aligned, when the two vectors are pointing in the same direction. And so for a very small epsilon perturbation, the maximum increase that you will get is by going exactly in the, in the direction of the gradient. There's a question, how good is this approximation? Or rather, are there cases where this approximation is really bad? Yes, the, the approximation is bad when the second derivative is, um, is really high or really low. So when the gradient is changing a lot, when, specifically when the second derivative in the x direction is changing a lot. When the second derivative in, with respect to x and then y is, is, is changing a lot. It is, it is really big.
So this is when you want to maximize your, your gain here. You point along the gradient. What happens if you want to minimize your gain? You want to perturb by some epsilon, and you want to, yeah, go the other direction. Great. That is just going to give you the negative of this. So that's what you are doing if you are doing gradient descent. OK. This is why it works. Um, gradient descent only, this, this approximation is only good if you're taking very small step sizes, which is why if you take too large a learning rate with gradient descent, you may not converge. You may not have something good because it, this approximation is only good if epsilon is really, really small. OK. Multivariate chain rule. We've seen a chain rule. Now let's see the generalization of the chain rule to multiple variables. Multivariate function, where each of the variables is itself a function of another variable. Let's call it t. What's the derivative of f with respect to t? Well, it's going to, let's imagine we move t some small amount epsilon, OK? Then x1 through xn are going to change by the derivative of the x1 with respect to t and the derivative of all the other variables with respect to t, OK? Then remember, we have this gradient formula. What's the change in f of in, in f? The change of in f is the gradient of f dotted with the, the amount that each of these individual variables is changing. We move t some small amount of epsilon. That's going to move x1 by some amount epsilon 1. It's going to move xn by some amount epsilon n. But what is epsilon 1? Well, epsilon 1 is just going to be the um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, these, these, should have, these should all be multiplied by, these should all be multiplied by epsilon. The change in, in x1 through xn is going to be derivative of x1 times epsilon, the derivative of xn times epsilon. And so the change in f is going to be derivative, is going to be the gradient dotted with all of these changes. So, the multivariate chain rule is going to be how much do we move f if we move t by an epsilon? We're going to, we're going to get derivative of f with respect to t is going to be just this. The gradient of f dotted with this, the derivative of x1 with respect to t, and derivative of x2 with respect to t, derivative of xn with respect to t. If we expand this out, this is the multivariate chain rule, the partial of f with respect to x1 times, this is just what the dot product is, the gradient with this thing, this vector, the partial of f with respect to x1, the derivative of x1 with respect to t, plus the partial of f with respect to x2, the derivative of x2 with respect to t, and so on. Are there questions about this? Hmm? In gradient descent, epsilon is not the same as learning rate, right? The, in gradient descent, if you're going back to this previous picture, the learning rate is, no, it's not the same. It's the, it is the, the ratio between the length of your epsilon vector and the gradient vector. Yeah, so again, here, the rate of change of x1 through xn is the derivative of x1, the derivative of x2, the derivative of xn. So the rate of change in f is going to be the gradient times these, the, 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 the amount by which all of these are changing, just because of this, the formula on the previous slide, which says that if you perturb x1 by epsilon 1 and xn by, eps, by epsilon n, then you perturb the overall thing by gradient dotted with this thing. This equation and this equation are missing epsilon. 
the final chain rule is not missing epsilon because, because this is the rate of change of f. You can think of this as the rate of change of f. That was why I, I left out the epsilon. There's no epsilon here because this doesn't, this doesn't, this is just a, this is a, an equation relating different, different derivatives. More questions. Seeing that gradient appro uh, approximation is a dot product, we can write this as a function of cosine. If you had access to the angles, you could write it as, as, a, as, a, as a cosine, but you don't ever really have access to the angles involved. Does this make sense that if we perturb t by some epsilon, then x1 gets perturbed by derivative of x1 epsilon? There should be an epsilon. There should be epsilons in here and epsilons in here. Derivative of x1 epsilon, derivative of xn epsilon. The change overall in f is just the gradient dotted with the amount which all of those have changed. So all of these. Is there anything unclear about this? Okay, so let's do an example. Again, this is the multivariate chain rule. Suppose that you were trying to take the derivative with respect to t of x squared plus y squared, where x is equal to t squared and y is equal to e to the t. Then we can do this thing where we take the partial of f with respect to x1, which in this case is x. The partial of f with respect to x1 is 2x. But what's the derivative of x1 with respect to t? Well, it's the derivative of x with respect to t, which is 2t, so 2x times 2t. For the second thing, it's the derivative of y uh, of, of um, the derivative of this thing with respect to um, y, which is just two y, and the derivative of y with respect to t, which is just e to the t, because the derivative of e to the t is just e to the t. If we substitute in these formulae for x and y, then we get this, which simplifies to this. Now you could have worked that out just by substituting in for x and y right here and then taking the derivative, but this is an example of how you would do it. In many situations, this is the easiest way to do it. You have x and y written as functions of t and you have to take the derivative of some function of x and y in terms of t. I'll leave the matrix uh, calculus until next time. Um, and I'll stick around for questions now. Also, there is office hours now.